Distrust, disgust, disappointment. These words have become synonymous with Bethesda, the game studio responsible for the once critically acclaimed series The Elder Scrolls and Fallout. Fallout 76 has been the obvious catalyst for this fall from grace, but I want to argue that Bethesda's decline was much more long term, starting in 2011. Before I get into their decline, it's important to appreciate Bethesda's initial success. Bethesda Game Studios was founded in 2001 as a spin-off from its parent company. By this time, four Elder Scrolls games had already been made, Arena, Daggerfall, Battlespire and Redguard. The first two games were massive successes, whilst the spin-offs failed miserably. Safe to say Bethesda was not a massively well-known name at this point, but with the 2002 game Morrowind, they were propelled to fame. Morrowind is seen to this day as one of Bethesda's crowning achievements. It combined an unprecedentedly detailed open world with an amazing plot and a fantastic soundtrack. In many ways, it pioneered the formula for modern RPGs. Indeed, this game set the tone for the rest of Bethesda's work. Their next RPG, Oblivion, came out in 2006 and similarly achieved fame. Oblivion retained Morrowind's basic formula, deepening and innovating certain elements. New features included better graphics, fully voiced NPCs, and a new physics system. At this point, Bethesda acquired the rights to the Fallout series, which had originally been the creation of Interplay. Fallout 3 was a hybrid game, combining Bethesda's now signature RPG formula with the post-apocalyptic world of Fallout. This met with critical acclaim yet again, and Fallout 3 won a number of Game of the Year awards, further cementing Bethesda's by now excellent reputation. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim came out in 2011, a massive success it might seem incongruous to argue that this was the beginning of Bethesda's decline, but Skyrim set Bethesda on a dangerous trajectory. It provided the foundations that the infamous Fallout 76 would be based on almost a decade later. Skyrim was a simpler game than its predecessors, with an emphasis on ease of play. It had a less complex class system, a more predictable narrative, and fewer complex quests. A comparison with Oblivion and Morrowind reveals Skyrim to be a less morally ambiguous game, where previous titles had you questioning the morality of your own actions. Skyrim's world is mostly demarcated between good and evil. By no means is Skyrim a poor game, its lore, world and storytelling in many respects are phenomenal. However, compared to its predecessors, it seemed to inch away from the core values of the RPG genre. Its lesser complexity was a way of widening its target audience to more casual players. No doubt this was a commercially driven move. A great RPG is not necessarily accessible, so by making Skyrim a more casual game, Bethesda hoped to make greater profit. Skyrim was a commercial success and it propelled Bethesda to a new high, but the fifth Elder Scrolls game set the foundations for decline by signalling two things, a move away from the core values of the RPG genre and an increasingly overriding interest in profit. The Elder Scrolls Online, which came out in 2014, confirmed these trends. In 2020, ESO is a great game, but it has only become so through massive reform. Initially, ESO, which was a $60 game, required an additional $15 monthly membership to play. Combined with the game's poor states at launch, from a lack of content to a myriad of bugs, this cemented ESO as a controversial title, far removed from the previous pedigree games of the Elder Scrolls series. It should be noted that ESO is not actually a Bethesda game, it was made by their parent company ZeniMax. Nonetheless, ESO is an important example of how the ethos embodied in Fallout 76 is spread across these interrelated companies. In other words, it seems like a corporate drive across the board. Fallout 4 was the next directly made Bethesda game, released in 2015. Fallout 4 was painfully average, a further continuation 
of Bethesda's drive to make their games more casual, it eschewed many RPG elements for the sake of accessibility. For instance, branching dialogue was removed and reduced to linear conversation options, whilst the grind to improve skills, as is typical in an RPG, is non-existent. Furthermore, a hallmark of the Fallout series had been realism, durability, ammo varieties and the such. Fallout 4 was a vastly less complex game in this regard, the term dumbed down being frequently used to compare it to its predecessors. Players felt as if the ethos of Fallout had been sacrificed for the sake of novelty features and somewhat improved graphics. So there were two main factors that drove the decline in quality of Bethesda's games, a desire to extract more money from players from the game itself, and attempts to widen the target audience by making the games less complex. However, I believe that a third independent factor warrants mentioning, Bethesda's increasing reliance on the modding community to make their games good. This company are notorious for releasing broken games on launch, unofficial patches being key to fixing them on PC, but more importantly than this, Bethesda became complacent by assuming that modding made their games desirable. Why bother going to the extra mile if a modder can just do what the player wants? Of course, modding is an amazing element of all Bethesda's games, but this attitude is a recipe for disaster. Players want to mod games because they're good in the first place, not because they have the potential to be so. I think we can split this transition that I have described into two phases. In the first phase, we have the inching into mediocrity that I have just described above, spanning from 2011 to 2015. The second phase saw a massive acceleration of this trend, and I believe it was kick-started by 2016's Skyrim Special Edition. Skyrim Special Edition is appreciated by fans today. It does make genuine improvements to the engine in terms of graphics and performance, but this paved the way for the release of future low-effort cash cow games from Bethesda. Now, obviously, it's in a company's basic nature to make money. That's the principle all businesses are based on. However, unsurprisingly, it's not good business for a games company to make consumer unfriendly, poor quality games. A case in point is CD Projekt Red, the makers of The Witcher games. The Witcher 3 made them a colossal amount of money, roughly 63 million in the first half of 2015, not because it was riddled with microtransactions, but because it was an excellent game with a reasonable price. In short, using consumer unfriendly tactics to try and extract much money as possible from a subpar game is not a good way to turn a profit. And yet, a year after Skyrim Special Edition's release, Bethesda announced the introduction of microtransactions across its games in the form of Creation Club. This initiative epitomised Bethesda's new attitude, that to make their games good, you'd have to invest more of your own money. Although Creation Club wasn't an absolutely awful initiative, because it made mods far more accessible, and if you don't want to use it, you don't have to, it is again symptomatic of Bethesda's troubling new attitude. The culmination of this second phase was, of course, the 2018 game Fallout 76. This game, quite simply, was conceived as a cash cow title. It had a wide target audience due to its lack of serious RPG elements, it was riddled with microtransactions, and Bethesda thought they could get away with releasing it early. In sum, the problems of this game were threefold. A. There was a fundamental lack of content at launch. It took them over a year to eventually add NPCs to the game. NPCs, a cornerstone of any good RPG. The original main story instead has you mincing across Appalachia in search of tapes which unveil the main plot. Overseer's log, or should I say, direct communication, because whoever True to the trend we saw with Creation Club, it seems that Bethesda had hoped that the players themselves would make up for a subpar game. In the case of 76, I think Bethesda were complacent in thinking that its multiplayer meant that players would make their own fun, meaning they wouldn't notice how bare this title is. Equally, like with Creation Club, they assumed that players would be raring to spend obscene amounts of money in the in-game cosmetics store to improve their own experience. However, no one wants to pay money for something they could have 
for free in Fallout 4, and not for a minimum price point of $5. You can buy real clothes for that money. B. Bugs. Bugs are always present to any launch, but Fallout 76 took Bethesda's reputation for mistakes at release to a whole new level. From god rays passing through rocks to T-posing ghouls, I think it's fair to say that this game was unplayable at launch for many. It's all well and good the game being in a decent state a year and a half later, but it's troubling that Bethesda think it's acceptable to charge full price for a game that clearly wasn't ready to begin with. C. Post-launch controversies. Having already dug themselves a massive hole, Bethesda proceeded to shoot themselves repeatedly in the foot through poor public relations. Firstly, there was the issue with the duffel bags. This bag was originally advertised as a canvas one to be shipped with the special edition of Fallout 76, but instead what consumers got was a cheap nylon bag. Other controversies include a data breach that occurred in December 2018, which revealed the personal information of 65 Fallout 76 customers, but the nail in the coffin was Fallout First, announced in October 2019. This subscription service essentially charged $100 a year for a feature that should have been free all along, namely the ability to host private servers. Fallout 76 was not a sudden turning point in Bethesda's history. This deterioration was a long-term process. Skyrim set the trend for increasingly more casual games, whilst ESO, Skyrim Special Edition and Creation Club confirmed Bethesda's new penchant for making as much money as possible through unfriendly consumer practices. Fallout 76 was the culmination of these problems. It is not what created them. The Elder Scrolls Blades deserves an honourable mention because it only furthers the aforementioned points. Blades is a free-to-play mobile Elder Scrolls game set between Oblivion and Skyrim with an emphasis on ease of play. Like 76, it has a lack of content, no new gameplay mechanics, and numerous microtransactions. It represents the degradation of the Elder Scrolls, a series that should never grace the screen of a mobile device, save through a YouTube video. To end, it should be said that Bethesda's reputation can be salvaged. People remember their good games, and there's a reason these continue to sell well. No one is better placed for a comeback than Bethesda. They know what they need to do to make a good game from their past experience, and they've had sufficient negative feedback to know what they shouldn't do. Starfield, purportedly their next game, will make or break the company. Fallout 76 changed public opinion about Bethesda, and if they make another god-awful game, then they will have cemented that opinion for the foreseeable future. At this minute in time, I believe I hope that the mistakes they have made are reversible. I hope that Bethesda can become the game's developer that it once was.